You're listening to Life of the Record, a podcast celebrating classic albums as told by the people who made them. My name is Dan Nordheim. The Walkman formed in New York City in the year 2000 by Paul Maroon, Walter Martin, Matt Barrick, Hamilton Lighthouser, and Peter Bauer. All five band members had grown up in the Washington, D.C. area, and several even played together in bands as kids. In the late 90s, Walter Martin, Matt Barrick, and Paul Maroon formed Jonathan Fireeater in New York, while Hamilton Lighthouser and Peter Bauer formed the Recoys in Boston. When those bands broke up, the five of them joined together to become the Walkmen, releasing their debut record, Everyone Who Pretended to Like Me is Gone, in 2002. Their follow-up record, Bows and Arrows, was released in 2004. In this episode, Paul Maroon, Peter Bauer, and Walter Martin talk through the making of Bows and Arrows on its 15th anniversary. This is Paul Maroon. I used to play in the Walkman, and I had a few thoughts on Bows and Arrows, which we did about 15 years ago. first song, which is called What's In It For Me, I remember we wrote it as an introduction, like it was supposed to be the first song of the record. What's In It For Me was the last song I recorded for Bows and Arrows, and I think the only song we recorded at Mercado, which was our studio in uh, West Harlem that we recorded our first record in. For the rest of it, we would gone down to either Sweet Tea in Oxford, Mississippi, or uh, Easily McCain in Memphis, Tennessee. If I remember it right, it was probably trying to come up with a song that could be the, the first song on the record when we didn't really have anything else like that. And for the progression, I was sort of copying one of my favorite piano preludes, which is Shostakovich Prelude Number 1 in C Major, it's Opus 34. It goes like this. You can sort of hear that the uh, the opening progression is similar to to our song. I also remember the drum beat being a very exciting moment, and we had rented a nice microphone, a C12, which we used for special occasions. So the drums are mostly that one microphone. I came here for a good time, and you're The song is mostly Walt playing a Hammond chord organ, which is called a Hammond S6, which is a really fantastic organ that he bought for, I mean, they're like probably $100 on Craigslist right now, I think, still. They're different than any other kind of Hammond. They don't, they don't have the same insides. It has like a left hand where you can play like different chords on buttons. And I remember thinking it was my favorite organ sound that he ever got. We played it on a old pump organ that we found somewhere. You couldn't really get enough, or maybe the, the pedals were broken, so you, you can hook them up to a vacuum cleaner to just blast air into it and it becomes really loud. And I think that's how we recorded the organ on that first song.
I remember when we finished doing everything on it. We finished mixing it, and we were mixing it to quarter-inch tape, and we were all very, very happy with it. And then I think we tried to mix another song like a week later, and we tried to put that mix at the end of the quarter-inch tape, and I think Walt recorded over the ending of our final mix of What's In It For Me. And at that point, like, Mercata's board was totally manual. Nothing was saved, nothing was written down, so it was like, you just do the mix, and that was the, you know, you go home and listen to it and see if you wanted to do another mix, but it was there wasn't really anything. So we erased the end of the mix. So I think in mastering, Fred Kevorkian, who mastered the record, had to, like, digitally kind of add a little tiny bit of the ending, because we taped over the last one second or so. Okay, um, the first song I'm going to talk about is The Rat, because that's kind of like the one that people like a lot. My memory of writing The Rat is, this is at Marcata, our old studio. Paul coming in with that guitar part, and it totally kicked ass. And I had wanted to put this really totally kick-ass sort of Joy Division-y kind of beat on something, which has like, at every at the end of every, whatever, but measure or something. I kind of stole the idea from a Joy Division Peel session where he does that. Anyway, Paul's guitar part was very kick-ass and intense, and I thought that making it incredibly intense with that kind of drumming would be really cool. The second song, The Rat, I remember the progression starting and the sort of the progression and the notes, the descending notes being just playing on a really uh, cheap acoustic guitar. I was thinking maybe we needed a, one of the songs with all the, you know, the eighth note guitar strums because all the other bands they were hanging out with had a song like that. So um, that was the basic idea for that. And of course, the singing and the drum beat are what make it great. And then Ham started singing, I guess because the guitar part is like, -na 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 -na. I think it reminded him a tiny bit of Help by the Beatles. And so Ham started singing Help on top of it, with that first note being the four of the chord, which is a little bit unusual and has a really sort of powerful thing to it. And within about, I would say, 10 minutes, the song suddenly was like, holy crap, this is a really good song. And I think Paul had probably spent a lot more time on it at home, so we didn't write it in 10 minutes. I don't know how long it took him to write the guitar part. Could have been years months, days, maybe it was just 10 minutes. Anyway, we put it together very quickly. The Rat was like a bear to record. We recorded it three times, I think, total. We definitely did it once in Memphis and then some other weird time. And we knew it was like a popular song. I definitely, looking back now, if people were to say we had a hit, which we didn't really have a hit, but I mean, if it was, if we had one song that was popular that people remember, it's probably The Rat. You know, like your, your uncle would remember kind of thing. And we struggled to end it. We could never figure out an ending for it because um, we, we had like a key change and all this stuff. And then we uh, finally figured out how to get back to the main part so we could kick ass a little bit at the end and then get out. The record company definitely wanted us to record it correctly. And they got this guy, Dave Sardi, to come in and record that one song after we'd, you know, kind of flailed at it a few times. We were kind of difficult people too i'll give you that and we were like very young and sure of ourselves dave was like this you know kind of hot shot record producer guy and we definitely didn't hit it off like we were we were really difficult he was difficult and it ended pretty badly i think like we we got the song everyone was happy I mean, happy about the song it came out and he did a fantastic job but it was like it was pretty heated you know we didn't get along great when I
that was the last time I ever saw him, you know. And then 12 years later, or at least for 12 years, I moved to Los Angeles, and it was the first day of school for my kids. We just moved them across the country from Philadelphia. We go down to like the schoolyard to meet our teacher, and there's Dave Sardi with his kids, and our kids are the same age. And it was a really funny moment because I think the last time I saw him about 12 years ago, we were just like shouting at each other. And then I see this guy, he's really nice, we're, you know, and he's very welcoming. And he's like, oh, these are my kids. You know, like, you know, your kids look really nervous. Like, here, let me help you out. And ever since then, we've been, you know, fast friends. He's great. It's just, it's, it was a real 180 from that experience. But I love Dave. You know, Dave did do a fantastic job. And, you know, I work, I work with him now. It's a funny turnaround. Third song. What's the third song? Oh, No Christmas While I'm Talking. For No Christmas While I'm Talking, I actually got the title from Misunderstanding a Song by the Fall called No Christmas for John Kays or John Keys. And I remember listening to it in my friend Aaron's car, and it was kind of hard to hear. And I thought he was saying No Christmas While I'm Talking. And I thought, wow, that's such a fucking good line. I wish that I, you know, I wish I thought of stuff like that. And, um, and then I found out that that's not what he was saying, and I thought, oh, great, now I can use that. So we uh, tried to find a good spot to use that. And I think that, I don't think that the lyrics in that song actually have anything to do with that title, but nonetheless, we superimposed that title. We always had really stupid titles for our songs, like fake titles or like working titles. And usually we'd change them to something pretentious, like No Christmas While I'm Talking or something like that. Christmas while I'm talking, which is supposed to be a rumble like the Pogues used to do, or Shane McGowan, I think, actually. No, no, the Pogues, like, um, what's that, the Patties on the Railroad song? Patties on the Railway? That was the basic idea behind that, and I think the progression is just straight up stolen from Coney Island Steeplechase, which is a Lou Reed song. This kind of idea that I think that stuck in, like, a couple times in our music, which is based on these sort of Irish dirge rumbles that we, we all love the Pogues. And they have a lot of parts in their songs where there's there's just this kind of rumble and it's following the singing. And there's no, you know, inherent beat to it, but it's kind of out of time too. You're, you're following the, the singer's movement versus like, you know, everyone following the drummer or something like that. We had like a little bit of that on our first record. There's a song called Rue the Day where there's a break that sort of does that. But this song is, is pretty much full on the whole song that way. Like, you know, one example of the, Pogues doing that is the old triangle. There's there's a lot of that in that. There's a Shane McGowan solo song called uh, Granu Wheel, which I think is like a really good example. So anyway, I think we're we're sort of ripping that off, but it's also it was just a thing that became very much of a part of our band is that feeling of just always following Hamilton versus you know where most rock bands are always following the drummer. And uh, I always loved that song. It has that huge, run- it has the chords actually that we borrowed from Over You, that Velvet Underground song from their live record. This super, super light song. And so we sort of did the opposite with our uh, arrangement. We made it just sort of the heaviest sort of rumble that you could ever, sort of non-rhythmic rumble. Uh, and it was great to uh, open, we opened many, many shows with it because it was uh, it really set a, a great tone. It was just a great way to start a show. So I've always loved that song. I remember playing this song the weirdest situation you could possibly play it because it is like a five minute relatively pretty boring dirge you know with no beat we opened for incubus at the oklahoma state university homecoming game or homecoming so there's like i don't know 
sixty thousand people from Oklahoma who've never heard us, and they're all oh, this is totally sober. You're not allowed to have a drink in the in the stadium, so they're all looking at us. It's like you know five p.m. or something, and this guy from uh, Sports Center comes on, who's like introducing the show, and he says, uh, he's like, ladies and gentlemen, um, oh, first of all, he has a he has a moment of silence for the victims of nine eleven. And so the whole stadium's silent. And then he goes, ladies and gentlemen, they open for Modest Mouse, the Walkman. And so it's just dead silent. And we start playing this five-minute dirge to all these Oklahomans. And needless to say, it didn't go over great. Fourth song, Little House of Savages, we did in the country. Walt had this great riff for the guitar, and then we built the rest of the song. For Little House of Savages, the main guitar riff and drum beat section, the down, 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 and the dunga, taka, taka, dunga, dunga, chaka, chaka. That little section was something that I had written for our old band, Jonathan Fire Eater, that had never turned into a full song. But that riff section, that drum beat and guitar part were um, still floating around and hadn't been used. Little House of Savages was written in a farmhouse in upstate New York that it was owned by our friend Matt Stinchcomb from the French Kicks. And I think we all went up there for the week to try to come up with songs because we were a little bit behind writing songs for this record. We were just sort of hanging around in the country trying to write bows and arrows at some point at a friend's friend's house. Um, we didn't have our own country house. Um, the main thing I remember about that week was that it was sulfur water, and in the, every shower you took, it, it was like bathing in rotten eggs, like really extreme sulfur water. Um, but it was a good time. We were writing in upstate New York at, at the French Kicks house, actually. At their, they had like a barn up there. And so we were up there working and started playing that song, and or playing that riff and drum beat. So we already had that song, The Rat, done, which is really dark and nasty and loud and aggressive and all those great things. We kind of wanted a companion piece for it. So I remember that I had that section with that sort of kick-ass beat. Well, I thought it was kick-ass beat and guitar riff. And then Ham put singing on it, and we added a second part, and then it became finished. And it was great. And we played it for years, because it was a lot of fun to play live, because it was very nasty and dark and aggressive. So uh, that was cool. We recorded it in Memphis, Tennessee, at Easley McCain, which was where we set out to record the whole record with Stuart Sykes. That's how it started. We got this van, and we drove down to Memphis. And Easley was a wonderful, like strange little studio down there in a really rough neighborhood, like where you would call Domino's Pizza and they wouldn't deliver because the neighborhood was so tough. We had a great time recording down there. And I think we got, like, at least what felt like the majority of the record there before this hurricane came by and knocked out the power in, like, half the city, at which time we were, we were, we were there and we were like, I don't know what to do. And luckily, Stuart, who was engineering the record, knew about this studio in Oxford, Mississippi, which was maybe, I don't know, maybe like an hour and a half away. And that place called Sweet Tea, and we went and finished the majority of things there. That's also a fantastic studio. It was, it was owned by uh, Dennis Herring for a long time. I, I don't know if it still exists anymore, but it was a hell of a joint. And uh, that was sort of how we did the second half of the record.
opened with My Old Man for a long time on tour, and it was sort of at the point where we decided we really wanted to be this incredibly loud band. I don't really know what was in our heads. It was like it was sort of this weird group think where we all decided we wanted to just be louder than any other band. And we had the sound man named Chris Colbert, who was always our sound man, um, and whose nickname is Pepper Jack. He was so psyched on it too, just trying to make it louder than just anything you could possibly imagine. It was so unpleasant. But it's kind of, I mean, I, I still think it's pretty cool. I played the bass on it, so the weird thing about the bass is that you only play one note, I think, for the entirety of the song. It's like a five-minute song, and you just play F-sharp the whole song. And till the very end, I think there's one note, like four minutes and 55 seconds into it or something. But weirdly, that was always something people would come up to you and be like, man, that's so sick. You only play one note. People really like that, which, you know, God bless them. Hundred Thirty Eighth Street, which is named after the street where we all lived. Ham brought that in, kind of done. The verses were done, and then we put in the the choruses and stuff. But I remember it being the first song that we had a strumming guitar on, and um, I think that was because of the, we were listening to the Basement Tapes a lot at that point. Uh, that's one of my favorite songs on record. The title of the song Hundred Thirty Eighth Street comes from the house that Paul, Walter, and me lived in together in. West Harlem for a couple of years, right when we were starting the band. And then I, I think, you know, variations on a couple of us lived there for at least five years. It was like an old brownstone that we rented out, out on 138th Street. And it was right by Mercado, the studio. I remember doing 138th Street at Easley in Memphis, and it was a, a very a very visceral memory of, we used to get these barbecue sandwiches like every day, like I think maybe like lunch and dinner, we'd get the same barbecue sandwiches at this gas station that, uh, that Stuart Sykes recommended. And we would just endlessly eat these barbecue sandwiches. And I remember trying to record the song, but there wasn't words for it yet. Or there wasn't like complete words for it yet, and I think it was one of the few times like all five of us tried to help Ham write the lyrics, and just failing miserably because I, we had these like dummy words that we were putting on it, and I think it's something to do with like Donald Rumsfeld. You know, it was like during the Iraq War, and they, I mean, there was like a joke, but <laughs> but it definitely didn't help speed things up. on that record I don't know I can't remember the rest of it I always liked the song North Pole I don't think it was a Walkman fan favorite at all it started out really we loved it at first and I think we had a really great thing and then our old manager sent us on tour for 
like a really long time. So that by the time we recorded it, I think we'd sort of run it into the ground and didn't know, quite know what we were doing anymore. So the version on the record, I think it's probably if there's a like the whole record I think is of bows and arrows is mostly successful. Like everything we were trying to do is you know, sometimes it's a battle, sometimes it's not, but everything kind of came out how you'd hope it would come out. The North Pole is the one that you're like, Well, I don't know, I think it could have been a different kind of song. But I still I still like a lot of things about it. The piano part from Hang on Siobhan is something that I got from this record that I found in my parents' record collection of my grandmother, Frances Powell, who was a music teacher at an elementary school in Washington, D.C. She's actually Ham Hamilton's grandmother also. We're, we're first cousins, and she's our grandmother. Uh, we never met her. She died before we were born, unfortunately. But she was a great musician and a music teacher. The main piano part was something that... Walt had like the melody from maybe his grandmother. It was like a hymn that his grandmother had played. And there was an old recording of it even. And we we're drawing from that. This record that I found had her playing piano and young children singing along Christmas songs. And there was this one song that I'd never heard the melody before. And I don't know actually what it is. I researched it and everything. And it sort of doesn't exist apart from this record. So I felt like it would be nice to use it. It's not exactly from the record, but it's pretty close. So yeah, we took that, we, we built the song around that beautiful little, very simple single note melody. I'll be back tomorrow, that is if you're here. And you promise to keep it between you and me. It's all just a dream, man, it's all just a dream. I've been up half the night, so get off it or leave. And Ham put some really great words on it. And Paul added the change, which is has a nice key change in it and does very cool things for that melody when we return to it. And uh, yeah, I love that song. It's recorded it's very quietly and has a great, great mood. And then there's a turnaround two thirds of the way through the song, like a key change, really. And that was inspired by something by Paul Robeson, like some piano turnaround that Paul listened to all the time. And so that's the basic musical bones of the song, I think. So hang on, Siobhan, you're a mystery to me, but you don't hear me asking around. So hang on, There was a girl named Siobhan that used to sing with Walt and Paul and Matt, sort of pre-Walkman band. And I don't know if that's what Ham, where Ham got the name or not. You'd have to ask him. New Year's Eve is a nice like little song. I imagine it was probably thought of as a record ender when we first came up with the idea. That's sort of what it feels like in some ways. And I think one big influence for it is that song Anywhere I Hang My Head by Tom Waits, where there's like the nice light beginning and then there's kind of party music playing you out. That's sort of how it's laid out, is like that last song on Rain Dogs.
used to play this one live. For those of you who don't know, we had a couple piano songs. And so somehow, right when we started the band, we made this decision that we'd always, well, we didn't know we were going to do it forever, but we ended up doing for 13 years was carry this upright piano around with us. So we bought these 64 key pianos that you could fit in like the wheel well of a Jeep Cherokee, because that's how we started touring. And we'd drag it everywhere we went. If we went to England, we'd go buy some rat infested, like nasty piano in some strange suburb and then drag it around and like carry it upstairs in London. It just got to be part of this crazy mindset where we always had to have a piano for God knows what reason. We'd always play the New Year's Eve and we'd play the song We've Been Had and a couple other songs. One tour, we even had two pianos. Like we started to get so into Craig's listening to pianos, and if you could find a cheap one, then you'd, you'd want to get your hands on it. So we had a trailer, and we had two upright pianos, and we'd drag them to these little nightclubs and throw them on stage. I mean, I don't know what we were thinking. Thinking of a Dream I Had is definitely one of my favorite Walkman songs that we ever did. Thinking of a Dream I Had is my favorite Walkman song. I think doing that band that we all did for, I don't know, 13 years or so, I definitely think that's it's the one that sticks out for me as, as the coolest and most fun song we ever had. I don't know. I love the beat. I love, I love everything about it, really. My memory of writing that is being at Marcata, our old studio, playing with Paul, and uh, he playing guitar and I'm playing drums. I always wanted to do a song that had just a dun 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 on the rack tom, just a gallop. And then you kind of were waiting for like the drum beat to really start and then it never starts and it's just like a stupid gallop going the whole time. And so we tried to figure out how we could get away with that. And Paul had that very exciting guitarist tone and rhythm that sort of made it work. And then with that weird bass part that kind of sounded like a Stooges bass part, that don't know, no, 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 I think which actually was something that I had from Jonathan Fire Eater days too. Anyway, somehow that combination allowed the rhythm to really kick ass, even though it didn't have a proper drum beat. It just had sort of a crazy gallop. And so that was really kind of great. And we had that music for a while. It took him a long time for some reason to get singing on it. And we almost had to bag the whole song. And we were so bummed because it was just the end of making the record. And we really wanted that song to work because we really wanted some big energy at the end of the record. Suddenly he came in at like the 11th hour with all the singing for that song. And we were thrilled. We actually recorded that vocal at Marcata. I think we did at our old studio, which is which we weren't doing much of right then. But yeah, I remember definitely mixing that song very sloppily with like sort of all five members of the band with hands on the faders, mixing it manually. That's a great memory because I really do love that song. One moment I remember with it is we'd, we'd play it all the time, you know, and someone would always not want to play it, and I'd always want to play it, and then I'd always kind of put my foot down and, like, complain until we played it, you know, but it would kind of go in and out of the set list. And then eventually one night we were playing at this place called Grimey's in Nashville, and it was the old Grimey's, like, the basement, and these guys came up to us, hey, we had a Walkman cover band on New Year's Eve, do you think we could play a song with you, or before you, or something like that? And we are like, well, how about you guys just play with... Ham 
you know, in the encore. Like you name the song and you play it. And they're like, okay, cool. So we like stopped playing. And then they came up and played Thinking of a Dream I Had with Hamilton in the encore. And they were so much better than us. They made it sound so much more like the record. And it was great. And <laughs> they, really, they really cleaned the floor with us. Bows and Arrows ends the record Bows and Arrows, and I love a lot of things about the song. I think that the verse and the chorus are two of my favorite Walkman parts. I still don't understand the first part of the song or the end of the song, like which is the same part. I, I didn't understand at the time, but I just sort of sat down and didn't, didn't raise my hand anymore. But it, I just don't get the beginning and the end. But I do love the verse, and I love the organ and the melody in the chorus. Goodbye to all your plans You can listen to me now Your head is bent out of shape But your feet are on the ground And all and all The ceiling's coming down I think when we were recording this song is when we got to a point where it's sweet tea in, in Oxford, Mississippi, and it was just endless. Like we've been recording forever and we were all bored out of our minds. I mean, like the, to the point where like your brain really sort of shuts off and it's just one of those like kind of endless, it's hot as hell, you know, it's like you're in Mississippi and you know, it's like a hundred degrees and you're just like not really thinking anymore. And we were putting Tiger Bomb on our eyes, like just to kind of, I don't know, because you're so bored, you just want to do something and it's kind of painful and like, you know, like laughing about it. And I think it's important to explain how bored you are because this is the only reason you would not think about what you're doing enough to do this. And so then I was like, hey, Ham, why don't you go put the Tiger Bomb down your pants? God knows why. I mean, but he was like, yeah, sure, I'll do that. And so then he went and did that and it was... I mean, his reaction, like, sort of flailing about, jumping around, was one of the funniest things I think I've ever seen. With you ahead, there's nothing for you here. Nothing wrong. Take a look around, you'll see it clear. Visit lifeoftherecord.com for more information about the Walkman. You'll also find a link to stream or purchase bows and arrows. Thanks for listening. 